Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here with another awesome history video. Uh, the Thirty Years' War. Uh, I don't know nothing about the Thirty Years' War. I've heard it mentioned before, like over the years. I mean, just like watching documentaries in general, or even. I forget which series I did where it was kind of brought up or mentioned. I forget which series that was. But I I don't even know the countries involved. It's got to be, it's obviously got to be Europe, right? Because, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm not really 100% positive. Uh, and, yeah, but I'm not really sure the countries involved. And apparently it takes place, uh, what he says, White Mountain, 1620. Um Hmm. I don't know because I've heard of like the Thirty Years War. I've heard of the, the Hundred Years War, and I think the Hundred Years War. I think that was France and Britain just because of a previous video we watched on this channel. It kind of I think kind of might have mentioned that. It might have been a Geography Now video. I don't know. We're on Thirty Years War now, anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're continuing our journey and learning more history here because that's what I love to do and. If you're here, then I, I guess you guys will do that too. So that's awesome. Uh, but uh, yeah, Thirty Years War, right, man? Uh, I don't. I can't really comment really right now because I don't know nothing about the Thirty Years. War. I feel like I should, but Thirty Years War, guys. Uh, I didn't realize. I think it was like ten video series here. Wow, impressive run run here for another long uh, series here. Well, not too long. It's actually a pretty decent sized series. Uh, but anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe, guys, while we, uh, start off our journey to 30 years war. Uh, also just finished the last episode of my Napoleon series, uh, Marshalls number six. So if you haven't seen that one, definitely go check that one out. That was done yesterday. Uh, really amazing video. Very surprised. That might be my favorite series I've done on this channel, you know? If it's not the favorite, it's definitely like top two. So, uh, but probably my favorite. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I love a lot of these series, man. Cause anyways, we're getting, I'm getting distracted here. Uh, let's get on to the 30 years war guys. As, uh, let's get on with it, you know, let's see what, hopefully like, and plus we're doing Kings and generals, which I've done before and they're amazing. So. Definitely subscribe to them as well as me, uh, because they are amazing. And this is where I, they've given me a lot of content to watch. So uh, I really appreciate their channel. Um, we're going to get the full screen here. Hope everyone's having a great day. Hope everyone enjoyed that Caesar series I did too. In the next chapter, here we go. Three, two, one, bang. <laughs> The European wars of religion had been progressively raging for two centuries, gradually growing in intensity. From the Hussite wars of the early 15th century to the French wars of religion in the late 16th century, it seemed as though a decisive conflagration was inevitable. The Thirty Years' War concluded as one of the most devastating conflicts in the history of the world, but began as a local religious conflict. By its end, Europe, its religion and its borders had been forever changed, and upwards of 8 million people had perished. What is the story of this cataclysmic conflict, and how did it begin? We shall begin our series on the Thirty Years' War with the Bohemian Revolt and the Battle of White Mountain. Alright, so apparently, you know, this is a, a war based on religion, which I guess... It shouldn't surprise me because I think a lot of wars are just based on religion, you know. So, uh, interesting, interesting. I feel like I feel like I just jumped ahead of chapter. Like I feel like you know, since there's been wars going on, I feel like you know I'm ahead of this. Like I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I should be, should have started this video like a hundred years earlier or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, let's get to it, guys. Bohemian Revolt and the Battle of White Mountain. 
The first bohemian unrest against Catholic rule, the Hussite Revolt, concluded in 1434 at the Battle of Lipany, delaying the Reformation for a century. In 1516, a Dominican... I'm sorry, I'm pausing. I, I'm just kind of like taking in like the map of what kind of countries are alive right now. I'm surprised the Holy Roman Empire is still a thing. It's 1620. Like that, that, that blows my mind right now how long that survived. Because I thought, you know, it went out you know, a long time ago. So my history knowledge is horrible. That's awesome, though, dude. Cause I just did, a, you know, Caesar. And it's so awesome that the Roman Empire has survived so long. It's so cool. Anyways. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's the beginning of a series, I'm trying to take it in. <laughs> Delaying the Reformation for a century. In 1516, a Dominican friar came to the Holy Roman Empire city of Wittenberg in order to sell indulgences, material ways to reduce the amount of punishment one had to undergo due to their sins. Hmm. In the late Middle Ages, this practice had become corrupt and commercialized. A German theologian, monk and priest, Martin Luther, objected, and famously nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church. Perhaps his most revolutionary work was his translation of the traditionally Hebrew and Greek Bible into common German, allowing laymen to read it for themselves rather than relying on their priests. This began the Protestant Reformation. That's a good thing. The 16th century conflicts precipitated by this reformation began with the massive German Peasants' War of 1524 to 1525, a religious conflict exacerbated by political and economic factors, a precursor of what was to come. This period of violence, which also included the Munster Rebellion of 1532 to 1535 and the Schmalkaldic Wars of 1546 to 1555, seemingly came to an end with the Peace of Augsburg, during which Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I established the key principle of curius regio, aeus religio. This allowed the many princes of the various provinces of the empire to impose their own religion, either Catholicism or Lutheranism, on their own territory. It hmm. stabilized the situation at first, but there were problems. The 1580s saw the situation deteriorate even further under the rule of Rudolf II. The causes of this are complex, but it was probably a combination of severe climatic stresses on the European economy, external conflicts such as the ongoing Eighty Years' War, and an intensification of religious extremism. In 1606, another key moment came when the Treaty of Schiedvaterock was signed between the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire monarchy and the Ottoman Empire. This marked a decrease in pressure against the empire's Balkan border, due to the necessity for Ottoman soldiers to quell internal rebellion and to fight against the Safavids. This mm. seemed like a victory for Christendom, but it also took away a unifying factor between the various religious groups in the Habsburg's German territories, giving them breathing room to focus on their internal rivals. Okay. In 1608, Protestant princes declared the Protestant Union a military alliance to defend the religious interests of their co-religionists under Frederick IV of the Palatinate. Feeling threatened by this, Catholic princes under Duke of Bavaria Maximilian I formed the Catholic League. One of the largest provinces in the empire, Bohemia, had enjoyed comparative religious freedom since the end of the Hussite Wars, and was one of the most tolerant lands in Europe. In 1609, Rudolf II issued the Letter of Majesty, a text which guaranteed freedom of conscience for all and liberty of worship for nobles, essentially allowing Bohemia the right to control its religious affairs free from imperial interference, but it was clear that this was a fragile compromise. Hmm. Rudolf II died in 1612 and was replaced by Matthias the who was more radical in his religious policies and began to slowly roll back to the right. The new emperor also had no children, so the succession was an open question. 
As a four-year dispute over the guardianship of the Electoral Palatinate concluded in 1614, Frederick V became the Elector. He was a talented military leader and a zealous Calvinist, who firmly believed in a Catholic conspiracy to annihilate German Protestantism and positioned himself as a leader of the Protestant princes. By 1617, Matthias fell ill and Ferdinand of Styria had been elected as the heir designate to the dread of the Bohemians. They had heard tales of Ferdinand's vicious counter-reformation as Archduke of Austria and feared that he would not allow non-Catholics in Bohemia. On June 6, 1617, he ascended to the Bohemian throne as Ferdinand II to the fury of the Protestant Bohemians. What happened next is debated, but the Bohemians either wanted to perform a preemptive strike in anticipation of Ferdinand's predicted persecution, or violence was already done against the Protestants. The issue of Habsburg rule over Bohemia was also a key factor. On the 23rd of May 1618, an assembly of Protestants went to the Hradschin, the royal castle, and insisted on seeing the imperial governors. After a heated exchange of words between the assembly, led by Count Turn, and the imperial representatives, the imperials were thrown out of the council chamber's windows and fell, becoming infamously known as the Second Defenestration of Prague. This was the trigger for the Bohemian Revolt, and Europe would consequently be embroiled in an apocalyptic conflict for the next 30 years. It's just amazing, like, you know, because this is different than, like, you know, other videos have done, because, you know, I'm like, it's religion, you know. These days, well, at least, you know, I guess around here, uh, religion's not, you know, it's, it's more accepting, you know, like, people really people really don't care what your religion is as long as you don't like basically push your religion on someone they people could care less what your religion is but you know back then like religion is like everything to people and you know they see in someone else's religion as like blasphemy like you know like as a sin like why are you doing that you know that they, they get obviously they get really caught up in it and uh but it's definitely different because you're kind of like really it's not like a country versus literally a country it's kind of like beliefs versus beliefs and i don't know trying to like push your beliefs and make your beliefs more well known and you know kill the other person's beliefs that's what kind of what it seems like anyway so definitely uh definitely a lot different than my other videos and definitely a lot going on like a lot of moving pieces a lot of different people so sorry i was just trying to you know kind of keep focused on what was going on because it's definitely different from other videos and i know it's just introduction they're just trying to you know make you understand like i guess how you know how the war started and all that so very cool stuff and there's what an 80 years war what was that an apocalyptic conflict for the next 30 years this scandalous act in Bohemia and the brewing insurrection took the courts of all Europe by surprise, including the Bohemians themselves. Despite the state of affairs, they were cautious and refrained from demanding the deposition of Ferdinand for now, instead addressing their demands to the sickly Holy Roman Emperor Matthias, maintaining a pretense of loyalty. Nevertheless, military preparations and actions began immediately by both sides. So cool. In mid-June, the Bohemians wrote to the Protestant Union, asking them for full admittance and military support in the upcoming conflict. In order to incentivize this further, they offered Frederick V, the leader of the Union, the Kingship of Bohemia for their support. In a diplomatic mistake, they offered the same to the rulers of Savoy, Saxony and Transylvania, oh which God. led the wider Union to declare neutrality in the conflict contradictory to their leader, the Elector of the Palatinate. The ruler of Saxony, the most powerful Protestant province of the Empire, had never wanted a war with the Emperor, and when Ferdinand offered him protection against any Protestant retaliation in return for neutrality, he accepted and mobilized his forces to secure his border with Bohemia. The Duke of Savoy, however, responded to the Bohemian call for help swiftly, and sent a 2,000-strong force under Ernst von Mansfeld, along with financial aid for the conflict. 
In May 1618, this Protestant force captured the stronghold of Pilsen, marking one of the first major engagements of the Thirty Years' War. The Spanish Habsburgs, at this moment in time headed by Philip III, were occupied by the Eighty Years' War against the Dutch Republic and their allies. Despite internal problems, they were still the most powerful state in Europe, and their aid would be key to the Catholic cause. By mid-1619, 7,000 veteran Spanish troops would be sent from the Low Countries in order to support Ferdinand. The Austrian Archduke also received similar support from inside the Holy Roman Empire. Bavaria, the most powerful Catholic principality, and its Duke Maximilian I, saw Protestant Bohemia as a threat to its authority, and also considered the Elector Palatine, a fellow member of the Wittelsbach family, as one of his main rivals for the position of Elector. However, these preparations did not yet make war inevitable. Though they were taking military precautions, it was not yet clear that the war would erupt so violently. The Habsburgs viewed their insurrectionist bohemian subjects as rebellious children, and themselves as the patient patriarchs, willing to listen hmm. to their complaints. In addition, many bohemians did not want to entirely reject the dynasty, but instead wished to simply reinforce the religious toleration concessions gained in Rudolf's letter of majesty. Okay. This relatively lax start to the conflict would end when Holy Roman Emperor Matthias died in March 1619. Uh -oh. This forced the Bohemians into a decision. They would either have to lay down their arms and accept Ferdinand as their king, or denounce him and risk open war. They went with the second option, and offered the crown to Frederick V of the Palatinate instead. In May 1619, the main army of the Protestants, led by Count Turn, marched on Vienna and put the city under siege, despite not having any siege weapons to launch a decisive assault. These successes were not to last, as on the 10th of June, the Catholic commander, the Count of Bucquois, routed Mansfeld and his 2,000-strong contingent at the Battle of Sablet in southern Bohemia. This cut off communications between Prague and Turn's besieging army, forcing them to withdraw. Even worse, Mansfeld's correspondence was captured by the Imperials, revealing in detail the Duke of Savoy's dealings with the Bohemians, Dutch, Venetians and English. He was embarrassed and, now aware that he would not be elected the Bohemian King, ended his support for the rebels. Uh... On the 28th of August 1619, Ferdinand II was finally elected the Holy Roman Emperor in Frankfurt, but he still had problems to deal with. In late August, the Prince of Transylvania, Bethlen Gabor, began the conquest of Habsburg Hungary and on October 13th defeated the last Habsburg army in the region. Soon afterwards, he moved up the Danube and joined forces with Turn, moving in November to lay siege to Vienna a second time. Again, this apparent success was not to last. On the 27th of November 1619, Gabor received reports that a large Polish army, assisting the Catholic Ferdinand, had entered Upper Hungary and cut his communications with his Transylvanian heartland. This ruined the Second Siege of Vienna and forced Gabor to rush back to Hungary and turn to move back to Bohemia. Imperial diplomats then negotiated with Gabor to cease his support for the Bohemians, and he accepted on the 20th of January, 1620. Interesting. As 1620 progressed, another Spanish army of 20,000 men began its march from the Low Countries into the Palatinate under the command of Ambrosio Spinola, aiming to secure Catholic League territories such as Bavaria. At the same time, an army of around 30,000 Catholic troops conquered Upper Austria, led by the Count of Thiel, while Bucquois' force had conquered Lower Austria. This done, the Imperial armies under Bucquois and Thiel united and thrust into Bohemia, seeking a decisive engagement. Oh, On yeah. the 8th of November 1620, the Imperial army met the rebels just beyond the walls of Prague at Bila Hora, the White Mountain. Oh, here we go. The rebels were around 21,000 strong, 
with 11,000 footmen, 5,000 Hakabusia horse, 5,000 additional Hungarian light cavalry, and 10 cannons. Their army drew up in the Dutch style, constituting two lines of battle, with interspersing cavalry squadrons between each battalion of infantry. Half of the Hungarian light cavalry manned the extreme right wing, while the other half functioned as a mobile reserve in the rear. Commanded by Christian of Anhalt, the rebel army set up on the high ground of the White Mountain Ridge, digging trenches in front of their line. Yeah. Thick fog obscured the Imperial approach on the morning of Sunday the 8th of November, oh, yeah, and advance guard forces secured two crossings of a stream two kilometers in front of the rebel position. After Ferdinand's army crossed, they began to form up. The Catholic League's forces, commanded by Thiel, set up on the left, while the Imperial army, led by Bucois, took up position on the right. 17,000 Habsburg footmen were organized into 10 large blocks, known as tertios, and were comprised mainly of pikemen and musketeers. The Imperial cavalry, meanwhile, consisted of six regiments of lightly armed harquebusiers, armed with a long harquebus carbine, and four regiments of heavily armed cuirassiers, wielding wheel-lock pistols and straight swords. Man. Supplementing them were 300 light cavalry from Catholic Poland. The army of Ferdinand II also had 12 cannons in support. The imperial commanders knew that time was on their side, so they did not have to attack immediately. However, the Duke of Bavaria Maximilian wanted a quick and decisive victory, so they decided to attack. Ever since they had been brought up, the imperial cannon had been firing uphill without much impact. At around 15 oh, okay. minutes to midday, all 12 guns fired at once to signal the advance. Imperial tertios and cavalry on the less steep right side advanced up the hill, opposed by two cavalry regiments under Anhalt's son, Christian the Younger, who wanted to perform an active defense. My God, look at Meanwhile, Terran's elite infantry division crashed into the Habsburg infantry, who were laboring up the slope. The Bohemian army initially had success in their downhill advance, breaking through the Imperial Curacia cavalry and into wow. one of their tertios by using their wheel lock pistols. Pikes clashed and firearms sounded for a while, however Thiel then sent more cuirassiers and dragoons to the right flank under Bouquois and drove the rebel cavalry away, rallying Damn. the tertios to push forward in the process. Can be quick, looks like anyway. Witnessing their horsemen retreating under the pressure, the Bohemian infantry began to follow suit, and the Hungarians in reserve scattered. Meanwhile, the Catholic League's forces advanced up the steeper slope on the left towards the rebel right flank. Due to the unfavorable terrain on this area of the field, the Bohemian contingents manning it managed to halt the advancing League Tertios. However, rumors of 300 Polish cavalry having already flanked the rebels spooked the remaining Bohemian units and they attempted to flee. The German mercenaries fighting on the right side of the rebel yeah. line were unable to flee due to the terrain and they had to fight to the last man. Man, geez, like, it's so hard to, get to tell, you know, the landscape, you know, just from, because we have, you know, bird's eye view right here. But yeah, if you're uphill and you got someone underneath you, you got such an advantage, man, because you're swiping at someone's head while they're trying, they're basically swiping at your feet. Uh, but yeah, because I thought, you know, that the, uh, they're called the, the, the Protestants, and then they're like, they're like the Catholics, right? Blue is like the Catholics, and yellow is the Protestants, or have that right? And, you know, the blue is like, you know, the rebels. And yeah, I thought, you know, they they were going to get wiped out, but then they held their ground there for a little while. But then, you know, I guess they just got into getting overpowered down here. And they have, uh, you know, the Protestants have the, uh, I don't even know, I'm not sure exactly what to call them. I'm sorry. There was a lot of names being thrown at me in that intro. And so I was a little confused a little bit. So I'm sorry. But, you know, I guess the cavalry, it's a huge difference. But and the terrain going uphill, I don't know how much of a difference that makes because I'm not sure exactly what the grounds are. Anyways, let's get on with the video. This video is almost over. Gee, I feel like we're just getting started into it. Unable to flee due to the terrain, and they had to fight to the last man. 
a later legend would distort this occurrence, and described the heroic resistance of these men who refused to give up. Yeah, they didn't have no choice, man. The Bohemian rebels had been utterly crushed in the field, and Thiel's forces entered Prague the next day. 47 leaders of the rebellion were put to death, 27 of them being executed in the old town square, commemorated by 27 crosses engraved into the modern-day cobblestones. The estates of the treacherous nobility were sold off to Ferdinand's supporters, and their possessions were plundered, while the Elector Palatine managed to flee. However, this was not the end of the conflict, and the destruction of the Protestant cause would catalyze an intensification which would drastically increase the devastation caused by the wider war. Our series on the Thirty Years' War will continue, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. I was gonna, I was gonna say, like, obviously this is the first episode, where, like, the war's not over, they, they won the battle, but, you know, so when it comes to religion, it's just so tricky, like, there's not, like, one single entity you're kind of fighting, I don't know, because people can always rise up everywhere and everything, and, uh, I don't know, I just... It's just so sad that, you know, so many people just died just based on religion and everything. And, uh, yeah, it's just a different kind of war. And, you know, a lot of, like, rulers and stuff use, use religion as an excuse to, you know, gain land or gain anything, really. They'll just use religion as an excuse, you know. Uh, but, yeah, definitely interesting. Uh, I'm definitely... Uh, I'm sorry, I was definitely a little confused in that episode, but like, this is the first episode, uh, and they all kind of get, you know, my bearings here, and uh, definitely interested to see, you know, what goes on in the next episode, so cause it's definitely a different video than what I'm used to, I'm used to, like, you know, basically, you know, you know, like, who the good guys are and the bad guys are, or, you, or you're following uh, a certain someone, you know, so you're kind of rooting for that someone, and so this is definitely different, because... You know, I really don't have a side, so I'm just kind of like going along here with uh, uh, you know, history and kind of just trying to follow it. So, anyways, definitely a, a very interesting uh, uh, first episode. Definitely, I wish it actually would have continued on longer, uh, just to kind of see where it kind of goes from there, to kind of see where we're going, where it goes from, goes next, everything. I don't know. Sorry, I probably made absolutely no sense to the entire video. I'm sorry. Please bear with me for the rest of the series. <laughs> but for me, definitely uh, definitely very interesting. I guess I said it a million times. But anyways, guys, thank you for watching. Please hit that like and subscribe. And we will continue on our way uh, through the 30 years war. That was like, what, year number one. So let, let, let's see like, if the rebels rise back up. Obviously, they will. Because, you know, but then again, like it's a 30 years war. There's a lot of uh, players involved. You know, a lot of different motivations. So, you know, we'll see where it goes. Uh, David, once again, thank you for watching. I uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate all of you. And uh, like, subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next videos. Peace.